Thank you, Mark. We are continuing our studies in the Gospel of Mark, and we are in chapter 11, and this morning we're going to look at verses 13 through 27. The Lord has taken a question from the leaders of uh, the city of Jerusalem about His authority to cleanse the temple, but the questions now continue. We read in verse 13, Then they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Him in order to trap Him in a statement. They came and said to Him, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius to look at. They brought one. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were amazed at him. Some Sadducees, who say that there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and began questioning him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves behind a wife and leaves no child, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children to his brother. There were seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died, leaving no children. The second one married her and died, leaving behind no children. And the third likewise. And so all seven left no children. Last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection, when they rise again, which one's wife will she be? For all seven married her. Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are mistaken, that you do not understand the Scriptures or the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the fact that the dead rise again, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the burning bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, you are greatly mistaken. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's join in a word of prayer. There are two things we are told that are inevitable in life, death and taxes. And they may be inevitable, but people are not resigned to either and put a lot of effort in avoiding both. So it is good to get some biblical perspective on them. And we get that in Mark chapter 12. When Jesus speaks on both subjects to explain our responsibility with one and our hope with the other. They were actually subjects that were forced on him when he was asked questions about them. It was Tuesday of the last week of the Lord's life. It has been called the day of questions because the Lord's enemies came to him with a variety of questions, all designed to trap him. He's already been asked a question about by the priests and the elders about his authority to cleanse the temple. But that didn't end it. The Pharisees, Sadducees, and Herodians had their own questions. They had conspired together to defeat Jesus by destroying his reputation and his popularity. It was a strange partnership. They all hated each other. The Herodians were secularists, the Pharisees were religionists, the Sadducees were rationalists. But a common enemy 
can make strange bedfellows. And each group felt threatened by Christ, either spiritually or politically. So they joined together in a plot against him. The first question was asked by the Pharisees and Herodians. It had the appearance of a dispute between them because it was about Jews paying taxes to a pagan king. The Herodians were mostly a political party. They were allies of King Herod. They supported Roman rule and Roman culture. They were for the status quo. The Pharisees were the opposite. So they appeared to be asking a legitimate question and seemed to have a genuine interest in the Lord's answer. They approached him respectfully. They called him teacher. Then they stated their confidence in him to solve their problem. We know that you are truthful and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any, but teach the way of God and truth. Well, that's true, of course. But they didn't mean it. They were trying to disarm him with flattery, which is usually effective because most people are vulnerable to compliments, even preachers. So they feign an interest in him as an arbiter, as a mediator in their dispute, and they seek to, to draw him in. Then they ask their question, is it lawful to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? The tax was one the Romans had imposed in AD 6 when they made Judea a Roman province. The great king Herod had died and the Romans realized his sons couldn't rule and so they took possession of it. They began ruling that area of his former domain and made Judea a Roman province and imposed this tax. It was collected from every Jewish male and it went into the imperial treasury. It was a hated tax. They had rioted over it. Imagine that, a riot over paying taxes. So this was just the kind of argument the Pharisees and the Herodians would have had. The trap was to put Jesus in a position where he took a side and either offended the people who were against the tax or opened himself for a charge of treason by opposing the tax. Jesus wasn't fooled by their flattery or the question. He knew it was duplicity, hypocrisy, he called it, and questioned them for testing him. He exposed them. Still, he answered their question. Though in an unexpected way, the coin they used to pay the tax had the answer. He asked for one and they gave him a denarius. It was a silver coin. On one side was the likeness of Caesar's head with the inscription, Tiberius Caesar Augustus, son of the divine Augustus. On the other side was the inscription, Pontifex Maximus, his title as high priest of the empire. Both instructions were religious, both uh, rather inscriptions were religious, and both gave divine honors to the emperor. They brought the coin and asked, and then he asked them, whose likeness and inscription is this? And the answer was obvious, but the answer gave the Lord an opening for his famous statement in verse 17. When they said, Caesar, Caesar's image and inscription, he said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. The coin was obviously Caesar's. It had his image and name on it, and they used it in everyday commerce, which showed that they acknowledged his authority. The point is simple. If it is owed to Caesar, then pay it to Caesar. That applies to us as well. 
People have obligations to the state. Government has been instituted by God. It has a legitimate and vital function to ensure safety, stability, and justice. It's what Paul teaches in Romans 13. So we honor God by honoring government. Now, when government overreaches, when government takes what is God's, then we must obey God rather than man. Peter said that very thing in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, when he stood before the Sanhedrin. There are numerous examples of this all through Scripture. Moses' mother and the midwives of Egypt defied Pharaoh's edict to drown all male Hebrew babies in the Nile. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to obey the king's decree to worship, to worship the great image, the idol that he, Nebuchadnezzar had set up on the plain of Dura. He said, you'll die if you don't. And they said, we're not going to worship that. And they were thrown into the fiery furnace. The apostles were beaten for not obeying the Sanhedrin's command to stop preaching the gospel. But as they said, we must obey God rather than man. And that's implied here. Caesar's image was on the coin, but God's image was on Caesar and is on us. We belong to him. And so his people in particular are to be good citizens. First of all, citizens of heaven, and then citizens of the nation. The Lord's enemies hadn't expected that answer. Mark says they left amazed. So the Sadducees took their turn at confounding Christ. They had um, a question about the resurrection. The Sadducees didn't believe that. Mark tells us that in a parenthetical statement in verse 18. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They were the, the theological liberals of their day. They were the priests. Their domain was really the temple. Their doctrine and religious practice was based almost entirely on the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. They gave little or no weight to the rest of the Bible not to the prophets, not to the wisdom literature, not to the historical literature. It was men of the Pentateuch. And they didn't believe in a whole lot. They didn't believe, for example, in the existence of angels. They rejected the, the doctrines of rewards and punishment and denied the resurrection of the dead. They denied that there was life to come. They were very modern in their views. They were materialists. They were rationalists. They had a, a hopeless belief about death. It was the end of everything, much like the Epicurean philosophers of their day. They were rationalists and materialists. So they came to Jesus with a question about the resurrection. It was very likely a question that they had used successfully to embarrass the Pharisees who did believe in the resurrection. Now we know a bit about what the, Fer the Sadducees believe from what Mark says here, but also we learn a lot about both the Pharisees and the Sadducees from Acts chapter 23 where Luke records a heated debate that took place between the two groups over the doctrine of the resurrection and their disagreement with one another. But here the two groups were cooperating. And the Sadducees were confident that they would embarrass Jesus. They had great success with the Pharisees, and now they'll have success with Jesus. It was one of those trick questions along the lines of, where did Cain get his wife, or can God make a rock too heavy to lift? They asked him about, a woman who had many husbands and wondered which husband she would be married to in the resurrection. What made the question difficult was that the woman's situation was due to an institution of the Bible. 
So they approached Jesus with a biblical question. And if he couldn't answer their question from the Bible, then his learning and authority as a teacher would be discredited and he would lose standing with the people. And that was the object of their scheme, to embarrass him, to make him look foolish. So they came to him with this question and they approached him with the same show of sincerity as the first group. They addressed him as teacher, a noble title to give him. Then they quoted Moses who said, if a man's brother dies and leaves behind a wife and leaves no child, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children to his brother. They were referring to Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5, and what is called the Leveret marriage law. The custom is found in the book of Ruth, and it's found in Genesis 38 with the story of Judah and Tamar. The purpose of the law was to prevent a man's name and family from dying out from the nation. So when a man died childless, his brother was to marry his widow and raise up children to him. Theoretically, this would go on so long as there were brothers left and so long as no child was born. And that's the way they frame the question in verses 20 through 23. There were seven brothers and the first took a wife and died leaving no children. The second one married her and died leaving behind no children, and the third likewise. And so all seven left no children. Last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection, when they rise again, which one's wife will she be? For all seven married her. This was a, a hypothetical situation, a highly unlikely situation. Impossible situation almost, not altogether, but a hypothetical situation that they had contrived to confound people who believe in the resurrection by showing it would result in intolerable, intolerable situations in the life to come. And in that way, they thought that they could show the absurdity of life to come and the absurdity of the resurrection. This is the logical conclusion of what you believe, in other words. So, having put forward the problem, they stood there confident that they had stumped Jesus with their unanswerable question. But the Lord did answer them, and he solved their puzzle by first explaining that their thinking on the resurrection was faulty because they began with false assumptions. They assumed that this idea of eternal life, and remember they didn't believe in eternal life, but they assumed that this idea of eternal life, life to come, will be like this present life. Better, perhaps, but, but still essentially the same. That was a common understanding in the first century, uh, common understanding among the Jews of that time. I, I would actually guess it's probably a pretty common understanding today among people, among even Christians, that things to come will be much better, but they'll be basically like this. Now that false assumption was due to two reasons. As he states in verse 24, they did not understand the scriptures or the power of God. That's always the problem. It's the problem today. We have the equivalent of Sadducees in science, men who, like them, are materialists. I was reminded of that when I read a review of a book on mortality that dismissed, that rejected immortality. And in it, the reviewer quoted a late Cambridge philosopher named Bernard Williams, who gave what he and others considered to be a fatal problem with immortality. And that is that it would lead inevitably to 
excruciating boredom. And that's inevitable because eternity, as he said, is an awfully long time to keep repeating the same old pleasures and passions. And so I think that was, I got you there. Well, it's true. If life to come is just more of the same without end, it would result in excruciating boredom. I mean, you like pizza, I'm sure, and I suppose in the eternity to come, according to this, you'd get pizza, and it'd be the best pizza you've ever had. But after eating a few billion pizzas over a few billion years, you'd get tired of it. And so there's, there's, uh, he makes a point. But the problem with his statement is it's not more of the same. The professor's problem was the Sadducee's problem. He didn't understand the scriptures or the power of God. And the order there is significant. It all begins with the scriptures. If a person doesn't understand them, he won't understand spiritual things. He won't understand the things of God. He won't understand God or His power. The Bible is clear on this. What is coming is beyond anything we know. It's beyond anything that we've experienced. There is no way for us to grasp what eternity and life to come will be like from our own knowledge and our own experience. Paul told the Corinthians that the things of God, that rather the things that God has prepared for us have not been seen with the eye and have not even entered into the heart or the mind of man. They are beyond us. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. He's told us some things. We know that eternity is coming. There are things about it we know. But when we compare that with all that is coming, we know very, very little. But that really is, is true of, of this life and how God will guide us and provide for us right now in the Christian life. How He will give to us the very best. That's hard for us to believe. Uh, th there is no way from a person's natural faculties that any one of us can know the things of God and know what this life is like and what He's going to do for us in this life. In this life. It all comes to us by way of revelation, not by way of human reason. A person must believe in the Word of God. A person must seek to understand the Word of God. A person must believe God's promises and act upon them in order to enjoy them and really understand them. It's what the psalmist said, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You're never going to know that unless you believe it and enter into it. You'll never know any of that apart from faith, apart from believing the Word of God, apart from believing the promises of God. They are great. They are far greater than the promises that the world makes to us. That is true for us now. That is true for us in this Christian life, in our walk with the Lord. There's more than we can possibly understand that He is giving to us and will give to us in this life. But what is yet to come is even far more beyond us. In Matthew 19, verse 28, Jesus described the millennial kingdom as the regeneration it is a world that will be reborn. It's not going to be a kingdom and a world just like this. Christ said it's going to be regenerated. The world is going to be regenerated. It's going to be transformed. It's going to be changed. It will be different from what things are like now. It will be glorious beyond our comprehension. But then, in Revelation 24, 1 and verse 5, God says, Behold, I am making all things new. The next stage of eschatology after the millennium is the new heavens and the new earth, which will be even greater by far. New and different, not like anything that we know in this world. So men, brilliant men, show how ignorant and blind they are by trying to explain eternity based on on false 
and naive assumptions and the hubristic confidence in themselves and human reason. Well, there's nothing new under the sun. Men were materialists, secularists in the Lord's day who were thinking up arguments against immortality and the resurrection just like they are doing today. So in the next verses, Jesus corrects their false assumptions about the resurrection and the life to come. The resurrection age, he says in verse 25, will be different from this life. Those who are raised to new life will not marry. We will be like angels in heaven, he says. We'll be immortal. There will be no death, and so there will be no need for marriage and procreation. The Lord doesn't elaborate on this, but he didn't mean that we will be angels. We will not be angels. We will be higher than the angel, angels, much higher than the angels. Our, our function and our being will be different. And of course, Jesus didn't mean that, that love will end in heaven. He's not saying there will be no relationships in heaven. They will, there will be relationships. They will continue, and they will be solid and substantial far more than anything that we experience in this life. This world in which we live is, is a mere shadow of what is to come. What is to come is far greater, far better. But the way of life and love will be, as I say, completely different and better than from what it is now, what these experiences are now. And that is what the, the Sadducees fail to understand. They were naive because they were ignorant. Everyone is who does not understand the Scriptures. You are ignorant to the degree that you do not understand Scripture, and so am I. We are all left with a gap in our understanding by not understanding the Scriptures. It is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. You who have been studying through the Proverbs in Sunday school know that. And the book really begins, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If we're to understand reality, we have to understand the revelation of the God who created everything, created you and me and this world and this universe, the one who created reality. Well, they didn't understand that. They didn't understand the scriptures, but they did base their conundrum on the scriptures by quoting Deuteronomy 25. So in verse 26, Jesus cites scripture to solve this, this scriptural problem. He quotes from Exodus chapter 3 and verse 6, where the resurrection is implied. Now, he could have quoted from a number of Old Testament passages that clearly teach the resurrection. Resurrection is not simply a New Testament doctrine. We find it in the Old Testament, and there are various texts where it's clearly stated. He could, he could have quoted Psalm chapter 16 and verse 10, where David wrote, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. And it's that last part of the verse that Peter was quoting on the day of Pentecost when he gave biblical proof for the resurrection. He said, the body of David's still with us, but the body of our Lord isn't. That tomb is empty. And that's what the Lord fulfilled. That was a prophecy that God fulfilled. Peter cited it that way. The Lord could have cited it here, but he didn't. He could have cited Job chapter 19, verses 25 and 26, or Isaiah 26, verse 19, or Daniel chapter 12, 2 and 3. There are many passages that either teach or imply the resurrection. But instead, the Lord quoted Exodus chapter 3 and verse 6, and probably because the Sadducees only accepted the Pentateuch, only accepted the first five books as authoritative, and because they'd also cited Moses in their question. So, the Lord went to Exodus where God talked to Moses at the burning bush. Literally, that bush is the thorn bush. 
which I think is interesting because the Lord who was in the thorn bush so long ago speaking to Moses in just a few days would be wearing a crown of thorns. The one who spoke out of the thorn bush to Moses would be speaking to these people out of thorns again. But from that thorn bush that was burning, he said, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Then Jesus added in verse 27, He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are greatly mistaken. What does that mean? Many think his meaning is to be found in the fact that God spoke to Moses in the present tense. He said, he is the God of Abraham, which indicates that Abraham was still in existence, that God had an ongoing, ever-present relationship with him. And the grammar would certainly prove one of the <clears throat> doctrines that the, Sar- the Sadducees denied, which is immortality, the immortality of the soul, because he is the God of these individuals who are still with him. But that's not really an adequate or full explanation when we consider the subject here. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, explain the resurrection of the body. The fact that Abraham's soul still lives doesn't prove that his body will be raised from the dead. After all, the Greeks believed that the soul was immortal. They scoffed at the notion of a resurrection of the body. They considered the body famously as the prison of the soul. You want to be free of the body. Remember when Paul spoke to the philosophers in Athens on Mars Hill. They listened to him until he got to the resurrection and then they scoffed. Why would we want to keep this body or have this body for eternity? We want to get rid of this body. So the Lord's explanation about about, uh, the resurrection certainly isn't proven by the fact that the souls of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob continue on. And its meaning... while not indicated, I think, in the grammar of the the word is, is indicated in the names that God cited when he spoke to Moses. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which recall, uh, he recalled to, to Moses in order to remind him, recall to his mind, the covenant that he had made with the patriarchs. Made the covenant with Abraham, renewed it with Isaac, and renewed it with Jacob. And that covenant that he made with Abraham and with all of them was unconditional. And it had many promises, and those promises are unconditional promises. One of them is a land promise. The promise that Abraham would inherit Canaan. You remember in Genesis 13, the herdsmen of Lot and Abraham were feuding, and so Abraham said, our herds are too big, the land is not accommodating us, we need to separate. So you choose. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. And Lot lifted up his eyes toward the cities of the plain, toward that verdant valley, and decided, I'm going to take the best. And he did. He went to the fertile plains where the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were. Abraham was left with the Negev, the semi-arid land where he settled. And it seemed as though he got the short end of the stick, even though the promise was given to him. But that's when the Lord came to him, spoke to him, and told Abraham, look around. Look to the north, look to the south, look to the east and the west, and then walk throughout the land. Because he said, I will give it to you and your descendants forever. Abraham, you haven't lost anything. When Abraham did, he saw he had confirmed the promises of God are sure. But when did Abraham receive the land? He never did. The only land he ever owned was a grave in Canaan where he and Sarah were buried and then Isaac and Rebekah and Jacob and Leah. Abraham lived out his life. All of the 
patriarchs lived out their life in Canaan as a stranger and sojourner and died without possessing it as all the patriarchs did. But God's promise still stands. So in order to receive the promise, he and the others must be raised from the dead and must be raised from the dead because God is faithful to his word. He keeps his promises. The resurrection is the only way that he can keep his promise and fulfill his covenant with Abraham and with the Jewish people and bless the whole earth. And he has the power to do it. Remember in 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul speaks of the resurrection. That's the classic text on the resurrection of the body. And at one point he illustrates the resurrection of the body from a seed that is planted. And he says it must die and go into the soil in order for that seed to become a plant to sprout from that soil. And it is the same with this physical body. It must die in order for it to rise to new life. And when Abraham was buried, it was an act of faith on his part. He was saying, in effect, this is the land that God promised me. I'm planting my body in this soil in the belief that it will be raised up to inherit this land. Nothing is too difficult for the Lord. No obstacle too great for Him to keep His word. Nothing can prevent Him from fulfilling His promise. He can overcome death and all of its effects to raise the dust of these bodies to a whole and glorified state. That's something that is hard for people to understand. It was an obstacle to these Sadducees understanding the resurrection, just as it is, was hard for pagan Romans to understand that. In the second century, when they persecuted the church in Gaul, today France, and in the city of Lyon, they burned the bodies of the martyrs, and then they scattered their ashes on the Rhone River so that they would have no hope of the resurrection. Eusebius writes of this in his Ecclesiastical History. Eusebius is the first church historian, and he quotes them how they said, Now we shall see whether they will rise again and whether their God is able to help them and rescue them out of our hands. But like the Sadducees, the pagans didn't know the power of God. Dust or ashes are no problem for him. Who is God? Who is he? Well, he is omnipotent, the all-powerful God. He is omniscient, the all-knowing God. He is omnipresent, everywhere present. And what that means is he is fully, completely present in every atom in the universe. Every atom in your body is occupied fully and completely by the Lord God, the triune God. That's omnipotence. And so when your body goes into the grave, he is still occupying every atom there. And when that body dissolves, he's occupying all of those atoms there. Wherever they go, he's there. He, and, and he knows everything. He knows where they are. He knows what they are. And he has the power at his appointed time to regather all of it and reconstitute it into the body that he will raise from the dead. It's no problem for him. He can do it all. Their problem was they didn't understand the Scriptures or the power of God. God is faithful. He cannot lie. He cannot fail. The, Sta the, Sa the Sadducees understood what the Lord was saying. He understood their an His answer from Scripture, but they didn't have an answer. Now, I can imagine there were Pharisees standing there listening to the Lord's answer who also marveled at it. This is the answer. This is the question that stumped them for years. They never had an answer to it, and suddenly there's this question, and he answers it. What baffled them for so long was answered by the Lord. And we know later on from the book of Acts that many of the priests were believing. Maybe this was where the seed was sown for so many of them 
to believe and come to a faith in Christ. The exchange here between the Lord and his inquisitors reveals a lot about Jesus and his character. A popular quote from Ernest Hemingway is, Courage is grace under pressure. Now, Jesus certainly showed that. His enemies were powerful. They were the rulers, the authorities, and the elites. They dismissed him as a simple carpenter from Nazareth. Has anything good come from Nazareth? If he was anything, he was a renegade rabbi. We'll roll over him, they thought. But he faced them all. He never lost his composure. He always answered the right way, exposed the weakness of their arguments, proved the truth of his position, and he left them all speechless. And he did it all from Scripture which is what we must do. That, that, that's always the strength of our position. The strength of our position is not the rationality of it. Now listen, the Word of God is completely rational and reasonable. Nothing's more rational and reasonable than it. But that's not the, the level on which we engage the world. <clears throat> it's from the Scripture, the Word of God. It's alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We're talking to dead people. We're not going to reason them to life. We speak the Word of God. We, we give the answers of the Word of God that are appropriate to every situation. And the Spirit of God works in there in, in that to quicken people and to open eyes that are blind. This is a supernatural life that we live. And we use the supernatural sword that the Lord has given us, which is His Word. That is our final authority, our ultimate authority for what we think and what we do and for our being. I think we're reminded of that here. The importance of the Word of God to our lives. But also, we are reminded of our hope and given reassurance about the future. And what it tells us is it will be glorious. John gives an indication of what it will be like in 1 John 3. It really doesn't give much of a description, but you get a sense of what it's like where he writes, it has not appeared as yet what we shall be. You and I don't know what we're going to really be like when that day comes. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him. And then John writes, everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure, just as Christ is pure. Now, that gives incentive to live for what is to come. That gives incentive to live for eternity, for what's eternal, what doesn't pass away, but is, endures for all the ages. Death is not the end. We have a glorious future. That doesn't encourage indifference toward the present. That doesn't encourage an indolent lazy life. Just the opposite. That's what John is saying. It encourages activity. What we do now counts for eternity. Whether it be small or great, whatever it may be, it counts for all eternity when it's done for Christ. We're citizens of heaven, but we're also citizens of this nation. So we should live as good citizens, as honest people, as the Bible instructs us to do. Pray for the king. Pay your taxes. That glorifies God. Even those little things. When we do what we're supposed to do, we please Him. And that is what will last for all eternity. Look, even if we could avoid the tax man altogether, whatever we gain would be lost eventually because we can't avoid the grim reaper. Death comes for all of us. Longfellow was right when he wrote, Our hearts like muffled drums are beating funeral marches to the grave. Every beat of your heart takes you one beat closer to that last beat. It's coming. That's true for every one of us. It is appointed 
to man once to die and then the judgment. Are you ready for that? Those who are have no reason to fear death. They have no reason to fear losing their worldly goods. Look, if that happens, if you're afflicted, if you lose your possessions, that is a trial. That's a test of faith. But the Lord is watching us always. He is guiding us. And He will raise us up to a glorious life that is without end. And all these things will be long forgotten. That's the hope of every believer in Jesus Christ. So again, are you ready? Have you trusted in Him? That's all one must do. That's all one can do. Trust in Him with even the faith the size of a mustard seed. Small faith. But it's faith that God gives. It's His sovereign grace and His sovereign work within you. So, if you've not believed, look to Him. Trust in Him. He receives all who do. Forgives them. Gives them eternal life. Gives them a glorious future of the resurrection and the kingdom and the eternal state. A world without end and a world beyond comprehension. And you who have not done that, trust in Him and then rest in Him. May God help all of us to do that. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your goodness to us. We thank You for all that we have in Christ. We thank You for this, this exchange that our Lord had with these men. It was one with hostile intent, and yet through it we see the character of our Lord, and we see how He has set an example for us. He had such a mind that He could have dealt with these men in a rational way. He could have argued with them logically. He could have done all of that and confounded them and confounded the greatest philosophers of His day, but He didn't. He went to the Word of God. He went to Scripture. Help us to rest in that and lean on that. Be men and women who know Your Word. And uh, through that, make us more and more like Your Son. And fit us for this world in which we live, that we will live wisely and profitably in it. We thank You for the life You've given us in Your Son. It's in His name we pray. Amen.